So you have this state of being, which is pure existence. And from being, uh, you start to become. From being, you become. And that becoming means the... Hi, my name is Yana. Thank you for watching. This episode starts with an audio introduction and continues with the video content. So remember to watch it until the end. And subscribe to this channel, leave a comment, share with friends. Thank you for being here and listening to Timeless Teachings. Welcome to the world of consciousness, human development, and full potential. Here we have conversations with people from all over the world about the subjects that matter for our mind, body, and soul, so that you can create a truly spectacular life. It is all about weaving the sacred, the soulful, and the ordinary into our everyday existence. Inhale, exhale, and let's begin. This is Timeless Teachings, a global podcast with Jana Frey. Today our guest is Dr. David Lee Shanktin. David is from Trinidad, a country in the Caribbean. He is the author of three books, a certified holistic health and strategic intervention coach, as well as a relationship and marriage educator. David is also a certified teacher of transcendental meditation and studied Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. Let's welcome David. David, thank you so much for joining us today on Timeless Teachings. It is a pleasure to welcome you all the way from Trinagard, right? Yes. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here also. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And as we always do during these interviews, uh, we like to start with our guests sharing a little bit about themselves. So please tell us a little bit about David. And you have an amazing class name, Li Sheng Tin. So now I really want to know your story and the background <laughs> and what, what is running in the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I come from a, a multi-ethnic background. My fa- grandfather was Scottish. My father uh, was from China. And my grandmother on my mother's side was from India. Uh, so in the Caribbean, we are all mixed. Uh, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, which is one of the beautiful islands in the uh, Caribbean. <laughs> and um, uh, what happened is that from very young, I was interested in spiritual development. I, I, I grew up as a Catholic. Uh, and so as a Christian, so I used to think to myself, reading all these beautiful stories about Jesus Christ, I would say, when, if Christ ever come, I would follow him. <laughs> I would do like the disciples. <laughs> and it, it was not until I was in my uh, uh, early 20s that I got involved in meditation. I, I've found Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Program. And I was fortunate to study with him and be very close with him for over 25 years. Uh, So I became a a teacher of Transcendental Meditation. And he introduced me to the whole concept of natural medicine and Ayurveda. And knowing that I was from a Chinese background, he asked me to study traditional Chinese medicine. So I'm I'm, uh, both a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, Ayurvedic practitioner, and a a health and lifestyle consultant. And I also have a PhD where I teach at our university as a health health and and lifestyle consultant also. So I do a lot of things. (laughs) This is beautiful. And just before we started the recording, you did share with me um, sort of a little bit more also about the family, right? So do we want to just uh, mention just a little bit of the story also with your parents and uh, um, 
what, what is the story in the family? <laughs> yeah, well, it's very interesting. You know, um, the Chinese uh, came to Trinidad, uh, my father and others like him, running from the war in China. That was in the 1920s. And they thought that they were going to America. Uh, That's but, a good one. Uh, it's almost like Columbus in a different way. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, there was this Chinese man who would uh, get them to come on the ship and they would land in San Francisco. However, they had no visa for America and they could not go back. So he took them to, to, to the Caribbean and they worked for him to work off out the passage. Oh my God. Uh, so it was a scheme. Yes. <laughs> But it was a good scheme because here I am. Here you are, exactly. <laughs> you know, here you are. And I always say that whatever happens in our life, and I mean, many, many of us start life in a difficult way. There are very few people who have probably such a good karma that they are born, you know, when everything is wonderful in their life. So most That's of true. us, it's not the case. That And if it helps us to become who we are today, I think it's wonderful. What they say, if life gives you lemon you make lemonade right so yeah. that's, that's pretty much what it is okay well, so one of the things i one of the things I, I write about in my book is that as you go on your spiritual journey you would recognize that the challenges that you had in life were actually opportunities for you to grow uh, it it taught you how not to be and sometimes Life throws you a curve ball when you least expect it. Like, for instance, what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, you know, people's lives are upside down. Many people, many children are going to find themselves in new nations. And uh, suddenly uh, their life will take a completely different turn from what they expected. And, and that is true of so many people I've met. I, I've asked many people in their retirement age, if life worked out the way they envisioned it when they were young. And most of them have told me no. There have been top uh, twists and turns, never expected, and here they were, you know? Exactly, you know, and, and I'm glad that you also mentioned the book because I wanted to ask you a few questions about the book, right? So, and so I think the name of the book is I Remember, which I find just a beautiful name itself because in my personal experience of being in a spiritual world for many, many years, I find this is exactly what it is. We are remembering beautiful. our true nature, right? And so yes, you don't know, yes, yes. about it. So tell me a little bit about the book, what the book is about. Yeah. Well, I wrote the book uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, this is my third book that I've written. And uh, I, I thought it took me a while to decide to actually write about my own personal experiences in terms of, of spiritual growth. Uh, I've been teaching uh, spirituality and meditation now for about 50 years. Uh, so uh, it, it took me quite a while to, to actually say, OK, I'm going to write about me. But I thought it was necessary because I see so many people on this path, this spiritual journey, that really do not fully understand this thing called enlightenment mm -hmm. or, or self-realization. Mm -hmm. There's so much misconceptions and things about it. And so I call it, I remember, because really all it is, is waking up or remembering who you are. In my very first book, I, uh, I entitled that Awaken to Your Divinity. Uh, I say that we are all divine by nature, made in the image and likeness of God. We are nothing other than divine beings. Mm -hmm. Some people say that's our soul, our atma, whatever name you want to call it. But that's who we are by nature. And this body that we have, I liken it to a car a vehicle that we enter so that we can move around on this planet called Earth. But it's really not us. 
of, uh, but it's uh, our instrument so that we can move around on this planet Earth. I remember it is really about my own awakening and remembrance of that reality of who I am in, in, in truth. Beautiful. So, yeah. and, so and the I've... subtitle is A, a uh -huh. Practical Guide to Self-Realization mm -hmm. because in the book, I pointed out that it's not just only meditation. Some people believe that if I just meditate, then that everything will happen. And, and yes, meditation is, uh, if you consider life like uh, a farming and uh, you as a seed, if the seed is perfect and the soil is perfect, then all you need to do is put the seed in the soil and water the root twice a day, morning and evening. And you will get a beautiful tree with all the fruits and everything. But unfortunately, uh, most of us are not perfect by nature. We have a lot of imperfections on different levels. And we'll talk about that in terms of the sheets just now or the koshas. But, exactly. uh, uh, and also the environment with, uh, that we live in is also not pure as it would be. But if we were perfect by nature and lived in a very pure environment where pure food, pure air, it would be very easy for us to realize the fullness of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that is not the case. So, yes, meditation is very important because this is like water in the root of the plant. If you do not put water on the root of the plant twice a day, then it doesn't matter what other strategy you do. The plant will not strive. But if you water the plant regularly twice a day and the plant is struggling to grow, then you really have to look at the soil and see what nutrients it needs. And this is like taking recourse to Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, health foods, things like this. But if the plant is still struggling after you do all that, then you have to see what is preventing this tree from growing properly. You're watering the root and you're taking care of the fertilizers, putting the nutrients, but the tree is stunted in growth. It could be that the roots are on rocks. And so the roots are not going deep enough to support the strength of the tree. So what you need to do is to get rid of those rocks. Now, in terms of human physiology, what are those rocks? These are our deep emotions. Mm. And mm. many people do not pay attention to emotions in terms of spiritual growth. They say, that's how I am. That's not how you are. That's how you have become due to life experiences, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So uh, my second book was Master Your Emotions, Transform Your Life, which actually taught people how to do what they needed to do. And in this final book, I remember there are many things on that because I do believe that if we cannot fix our emotions, then we cannot express the fullness of ourselves. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And I would like to dive also deeper in this topic. And I know that in your book, uh, you talk exactly about five doshas, right? Yeah. And you kind of now started in a more like a storytelling way to explain to us also with the seed and the tree and everything. And I love how you do this because it, it puts some perspective for the mind. So right. now we know, okay, so here I am, I'm the seed, I want to grow. And so it makes it easy to understand. So let's look at doshas one by one. You know, if you could take us through them, so what, what is the significance? And also, in a, especially in a modern life, people who usually have busy schedules and do all kinds of things, and still they want to progress on the spiritual path. So how do we do that? <laughs> Very nice question. Well, doshas really come from Ayurveda, uh, where they speak about different body types. So uh, some people are slim by nature. Some people speak fast, uh, are very creative. 
uh, whole erratic schedules in eating and sleeping. And these people are generally considered vata by nature, mm. which is one of the doshas. Mm -hmm. uh, very creative people, very vibrant personalities. But um, they, if you look at someone who is sitting at a desk or in their room, everything is scattered all over. But they seem to know how to maneuver their way through that. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, they will be working on three or four things at the same time and sometimes not finishing anything before they go on to something else. Mm -hmm. So that is a Vata kind of person. And then you have Pitta. Pitta uh, is the fiery nature. And uh, Pitta deals with all the anabolic and catabolic changes within the body itself. These people tend to be medium built, very sharp intellect. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very bright. Uh, Pitta people tend, when Pitta is a little off, they tend to be a little aggressive mm -hmm. in their uh, uh, dealing with people. Uh, two things you don't keep away from someone who is bitter is when they're hungry and when they want to sleep mm. because they will bite your head off. <laughs> I can but, relate to that because I did my Ayurveda check and uh, Peter is like, I am Peter Vata Kapoor. So, yes, right, I right, right. This. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, but... Um, but they, they, they are great uh, people, you know. And then the last is uh, Kafa. The Kafa is like the administrator. So I like to use examples to bring things up. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, you had Vata Pitta Kafa going on a trip mm -hmm. through the jungle. Mm -hmm. So the car pulls up. And the first person out, <coughs> out of the car would be Vata. And Vata takes the machete and start cutting uh, apart. And Pitta says, no, 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 hold it, hold it. We need to see exactly where we're going to go. Pitta pulls out the map and says, this is the route. Here's where we go. This is the tree you cut. Vata, by the time, uh, is very impatient. He's like, yes, let's get on with this move, you know. Mm -hmm. Kafa is sitting, listening to everything. And mm -hmm. once Pitta says, let's go, uh, then Pitta is directing the show. Vata cut this. And um, so Vata is running ahead. Pitta is saying, no, this, that. And Vata is, and Kafa is cleaning up the part so everybody can come. Mm, this is so beautiful. I love that. And that's how we get individually and collectively into the self yes, yes. So right? everybody has their part to play in life. But I hasten to say that most people are not monodosha, meaning that they are not just vata or pitta or kapha. They're a combination. You could be mm -hmm. vata, pitta, pitta, vata, or kapha, or vata. And, and uh, there's a lot in that study. And That's when we point. do consultation, you know, we, we take the pulse on the radial yes. artery. Mm -hmm. And through there, we can discover what's going on in the body based on vata pitta kapha imbalances. Yes. So that's yeah. a synopsis of vata pitta kapha. Mm -hmm. And also in your book, in the other words, you call it sheets, right? So this is like a different word for... Yes, this is a different thing. Um, but then in the book, you mentioned five of them. This Is, is it something yes. different? Mm -hmm. Yes, completely different from doshas. Doshas mm -hmm. deals with personality in terms of the body itself, right? But sheets... Um, so to really understand what sheets are, we can think of the body uh, made up of many different layers itself. Because all of life is all energy. Mm -hmm. Everything is energy. And this energy, according to modern physics, quantum mechanics and, and, and uh, studies like this, they actually say at the basis of life is a unified field of energy, mm -hmm. all integrated together, which contains all the laws of nature that are responsible for everything in creation, including the human physiology. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the scientists have said that everything in the universe is collapsing and emerging from this field at infinite speed. The time it has taken me to tell you that, 
Mm-hmm. We have disappeared and reappeared many times. <laughs> so emerging from that field, uh, the Vedic uh, seers, uh, who we call rishis and maharishis, have mm-hmm. said that underlying everything in creation is a field of consciousness, pure consciousness, pure intelligence. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation, called it the field of pure creative intelligence. Mm-hmm. And some of your audience may know it as Sat Chit Anand, yes. Nirvana, uh, you know, uh, there, there are so many sayings that describe that. But all the seers through time uh, who were involved in helping people to grow uh, spoke about this nature within. Uh, the, in the Bible, they say, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven within, and mm-hmm. all will be granted unto you. The Bhagavad Gita says, Yuga Stap Kuru Kamani, establish yourself in that state of being or mm-hmm. pure consciousness, and then perform action. And uh, you hear the Buddha speak about nirvana, mm-hmm. that peaceful level of life. They all mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. What is different is that it's not that people did not know this, but how to access that on a regular basis was missing. So if you can think uh, of this unified field of pure consciousness as the ocean, and we are like waves appearing on the ocean. So here you have this ocean, and then... Uh, a, 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 a wave is now starting to rise out of that ocean. So we say it like this. So you have the state of being, which is pure existence. And from being, uh, you start to become. From being, you become. And that becoming means the, you start from existence to exist. Mm -hmm. An individual is born, and that is what is called the ego. And the first sprouting of that individual, uh, and I will use an analogy so that you can understand it a little clearer. Most people have seen the river entering the ocean. Have you seen that, where the river is entering the ocean? At the point where the river touches the ocean and the river is moving back out from the ocean, just at that junction point, Mm -hmm. when the river touches the ocean, it is both river and ocean at the same time because it's on the junction point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe some people are not familiar with river and ocean, but if you can think of the sky touching the horizon or appears to touch the horizon, the, that line, that is like a junction point between absolute state of life, state of being, pure existence, and relative state of life, which is this life that we know. On that junction point, this is where the individual, if he can sit on that junction point, that is the first sheet of life. Mm-hmm. That sheet is known as the the, uh, knowledge sheet, where all knowledge is available. And this is where intuition comes from. When an individual can turn the attention within and transcend, the word simply means go beyond higher levels of mental activity and settle on that state where they're like a lamp at the door that is shining inside and outside the house at the same time. You know, if you put the lamp right there on the threshold, it's mm-hmm. shine inside and outside. If the person could be like that lamp at the door, then all knowledge, anything they want to know, they just ask and the answer comes to them. And that's called uh, 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 the feel, the first sheet, the knowledge sheet. Isn't it also, but in the other words, people call it the collective consciousness? Yes, the collective consciousness is, is actually more the, the state of being itself. Mm-hmm. 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, where, where everything, like all the waves have settled down into the ocean. So all you have is just one unbounded ocean of consciousness. Uh, but uh, as consciousness becomes conscious, then the intelligence, which is inherent in consciousness, becomes intelligent. Mm -hmm. It takes a form. And that form means an individual is born. And the nature of the intelligence, the intelligence is to discriminate, to break up this wholeness into parts, into boundaries. And so we, here we are talking about energy. So this is the finest level of the energy field. And that is the birth of the individual, where I is, but, but arm is not present yet. Just say I. When the arm comes, where, when you say I am, then the question is, I am what? Mm. And what means there's an identification. Uh, and so for that identification to take place, then memory has to kick in. And that's another sheet. The memory sheet. The memory sheet. Yes. And, that, and within that memory sheet are the emotions. And he right? was saying so, that before, right? That without processing and healing and transcending emotions, yes. we cannot so really no, self-realization. So, yeah. So the emotion are really the, the finest feeling level. Because uh, for those who meditate, and who have had experiences in, in their meditation, they most probably would have become aware at some time of just being totally unaware of body and surroundings and just in a state of unbounded awareness, meaning that the awareness is not limited by anything. There's no thought in the mind, no distraction. It's just a feeling of pure awareness. If one can stay on that level, then the experience is one of bliss. Uh, and that's why in the Vedic teachings, you will hear sat, chit, anand. Anand means bliss. But anand could only appear when an individual is born. Because without someone to experience, there is no bliss. There's just pure consciousness, which is Satchit. Mm. So Satchit Anand, Anand only appears when that individual is now on that line, like lamp at the door, sitting there and being aware of the fullness of themselves, which is this unbounded state, and aware at the same time of their individuality. Beautiful. Is that making some sense? Yeah, uh, for to me, absolutely. And I know that we do have all kinds of people listening to us and including teachers and advanced practitioners. So I think they will definitely understand what you're saying. And those who are maybe just at the beginning of the past, and I'm referring to some of the people who are watching or listening right now, if you go like, wow, that's like a lot of things, right? So I can <laughs> yeah. just say that that's okay. That's okay. And you go at your pace and you also don't even need to understand every word or everything that we're discussing right now. Eventually it will make sense. But for you, yes. David, please continue. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that's why I wrote the book because in the book, one can get a clear, clear understanding and view. And then you can put it down and think about it. You know, yes. and you could go yes. back to it. And as you grow in consciousness, then these, because these layers are very, very fine distinctions. That most people uh, uh, in their beginning stages of meditation would not be able to stay on these levels. They go in and come out quickly. And mm -hmm. we'll see why that is. If we have time, we will see. But so from there, now you have this experience of bliss, of fullness. Now, I want to say something about this word bliss because uh, so it, it, everybody talk about bliss, bliss, bliss. But what really is bliss? Bliss is not ha-ha happiness, laughter. Uh, bliss is a fullness that one feels inside. 
where every cell in the body is lively with energy. Mm. And it's a beautiful feeling of liveliness. In that state of bliss, a fullness is there. What is that fullness? The fullness that one feels very close to the creator, if one wants to call it the universe or God or whatever it is. And in that fullness, the heart overflows with love. Yeah. And that's why they say God is love. So when we're on that level, we're experiencing the fullness of the love of God. And in terms of an emotion, that is bliss. I see. I like how you describe it. It is very beautiful and very precise also. So, so and, and here we come into a very subtle understanding. So here now you bliss, and then you're now in the field of emotion. So in that blissful state, you start to remember who I am and what I am. And that now, you cannot have a feeling because bliss is a feeling without an intellectual understanding of the feeling. And so we give a name to the feeling, and that is the emotion. So we will say, oh, I'm feeling happy. <laughs> and why am I feeling happy would be the question. Why? Oh, maybe it's because I'm meditating. That thought will come to the mind. So here, what starts to happen is the awakening of the intellect from the feeling level to more gross level. And this is another sheet. Mm. Right, so these are the koshas. So, so we go now into the level of the intellect, into the thought, into discrimination. Within the emotion itself, the, 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 that fine feeling level is actually where our subconscious mind is. And that is what is ruling everything in our life on the surface of life. Because whatever we're doing is based on a memory. Mm -hmm. We may think, oh, I'm just doing this. No, no, but it's based on a memory. A memory of something. Why it is that you feel good about this is because of a memory. Maybe a childhood memory or some memory that created a neural net in your brain that tells you this is a good thing. So your mother baked a cake when you were young and you didn't know what a cake was. And she said, oh, uh, taste this, and you tasted it, and you thought, oh, it's so nice, mommy, I love it. In the head, that's a memory. And next time you see your mother put flour and sugar and eggs on the table, as a child, you will say, oh, a cake. And you will be excited because it tasted good. If it tasted bad, maybe it didn't come out good. You will say, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> So this is how memory is formed. And those memories are there in the subconscious mind. Now, if you have negative memories, say something dramatic or traumatic happened as a child, like some of these children from Ukraine are going through, then that will have a, a, a lasting effect on the physiology. And it could affect the way you look at people. It could affect your relationship. It could affect your view on life. So these are the blocks deep within the physiology that prevent us from living the fullness of who we are. Because some people would say, I have been practicing some spiritual thing for so many years. Why it is I'm, I'm still like this? And what would you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, I, I was given a talk recently and, and I use this analogy. Have you ever been to a, a virtual reality parlor where mm -hmm. you put on the glasses yeah. mm -hmm. and everything that flashes in front of your eyes seem to be real? Mm -hmm. And so you start reacting to something that's not there. If someone looks at you, they'll say, you're crazy. What are you fighting? What are you shouting about? <laughs> well, as we go through the, these sheets of life from the uh, intellect into the, the, the breath, 
into the physical body, the anamaya kosha, which is now this physical body, then the five senses take over. And the five senses project us outside. And everything that we see outside ourselves tell us this is real. And they trap us. So what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell, uh, we put on the television, we, we, we read a book, uh, we hear conversation from our family and friends, and they tell us life is hard. Or love, it comes from somebody outside yourself. If you want to love, you have to find a partner, someone who loves you, else you have no love. <laughs> and if you want to be happy, then you have to find things outside to make you happy. Come to the islands, go for a swim, go to a movie, go and meet a friend, you will be happy. And whether it is you read a book or you watch it on the television or whatever, everything is telling you that is your reality. And when that happened, you are swamped with a belief system that is false. That is why the ancient call it Maya, illusion. Mm -hmm. Is that making some sense? Absolutely. Am I saying too much? No, no, no. You're perfect with everything that you are saying. I am loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely uh, aligned with many of the things that I also heard from other schools and teachers. So I think it's what you said, you know, in all sort of mystical or conscious or other ways of living life uh, in the ancient way, people talk about the same things, right? Like, for example, I know like in the Buddhism, they would talk about the emptiness and it's the same. It's the, yes. it's, the, it's, the it's like the, the illusion of the reality. And it's also the emptiness and then the phenomena that appears out of the emptiness. So it's a very similar, you know, thing. But then I feel that for people, I would feel for modern minds, um, it's like it's a wonderful idea when we understand it in theory or intellectually. And then in reality, I find it's very hard for people to understand, right? Yes. So it's like when you look around and then, okay, maybe intellectually, I would say, well, I understand that what I see around might not be real because it's sort of energetically just a projected reality, which I am projecting, right? But when I touch the table now where my computer stands, it feels very real to me, right? So if I have my morning tea, when I touch the cup, it feels also very real. And um, so what is, what is the balance here? So this is the question, right? Because that's the other thing which I have also been noticing with people, especially who maybe not following a particular teacher and not following a certain school, which have like a, a track record and proven methodology to do things, but maybe more bits and pieces from the internet. And now, especially like I feel my generation, you know, and people who are like 10, 15 years younger than me. So, I mean, all this information right now on the internet and people saying, oh, who cares about a teacher or school? I can just YouTube it or TikTok it, yes. you know, <laughs> and, and everything is there. And then what happens when I just look around at those people, I see that many of them are lost. Yeah. Because even though they have been practicing, right? Because then it's like they left point A, but they haven't arrived in point B. And they just lost in between. And so yeah. that's, I guess, my question here. So how do we do this in a way that actually brings us into self-realization? Beautiful. Very, very beautiful insight. You know, everybody will follow their own path based on their level of evolution. It is one thing to understand intellectually uh, what the story of life is about. And, and that is necessary because it, it offers you the, the thirst. But this is like menu without food. So you get a brochure from a nice restaurant and you look at it and you say, wow, yeah, I got to eat there. <laughs> but somehow you can't reach the restaurant. And so uh, with the knowledge that good food is available, you suffer. Sometimes you suffer more 
knowing that there is food because it makes you hungrier than when you didn't know that such food existed. <laughs> That's a good analogy. That's why they say sometimes you... ignorance is bliss, right? Sometimes people say that. <laughs> yeah, ignorance is bliss. So how do you bridge that gap? Well, you're right in this information age. Uh, so many people try to uh, do things themselves or learn from people who are not really trained. And having spoken on stages with so many so-called enlightened people, uh, you, you see that quite a lot of people who speak, speak from intellectual understanding mm -hmm. and not from direct experience. Because what I just shared with you there in terms of the sheets, uh, you, to really know that you have to become it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, to, you can understand, yes, there is, an, uh, you know, Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the bliss sheet and all this sort of thing. But it, it's just words. But when you transcend, go beyond everything, uh, uh, able to remove all the thoughts and distractions from the mind, then you appear. And I liken this. And I love to use little analogies to make it easier. So if you have a television in your room and uh, you have no picture on the screen, then what you have is a blank screen. But once you put a picture on the screen, then the screen disappears because you're totally captivated by that picture. And you cannot see the screen on which that picture is being uh, uh, displayed. What is that screen? That screen is a screen of pure consciousness mm -hmm. on which all images, all everything is being displayed on that field of consciousness. But once the, that picture uh, comes, then we forget pure consciousness. So in order to experience the state of peer consciousness, you have to get rid of everything on the screen. But how to do that? People say, this is why they say the mind is like a monkey and you have to control the mind and concentrate and all this sort of thing. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said in one verse, be without the three gunas uh, and be without desires. And some people have interpreted that as desires are bad because they keep you back from having uh, the fullness or experiencing the fullness of life. So a whole system developed where don't have this, don't have materialism, don't have this, uh, don't, 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 uh, because all these things are bad. And so you find people not wanting to involve in having uh, a, a material existence. They want to, to wear some dress or something and walk around with a bowl and, and beg and nature will take care of me. Mahashi says that is not the reality of life. The reality is to live 200% of life, 100% inner fulfillment and 100% outer achievement. Now, what prevents you from having those 200 percent is the uh, uh, the mind being attracted outside to believe in something that really doesn't exist because everything that we think of say for instance someone says i love you who do they love really an image in their head they have this idea that Oh, when I meet this person with this quality, looking like this and that and that, then I will fall in love with them. And that will be my lover. <laughs> but that person doesn't exist. That person only exists in your head. Because the person that you're looking at, how many thousands of people have an image of that person, which is completely different from the one that you have. And so it's an illusion. 
in your head, but you say, I've fallen in love. And then that person one day does something that was not part of your paradigm. And then you say, how could you be like that? You're not the person that I fell in love with. <laughs> well, according to this, the story of many relationships, committed Absolutely. marriages, right? Now people Absolutely. say, I don't love you anymore because you are not what I want you to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's all fallacy. Why? Because we have been taught that love is outside. Remember, earlier on in the discussion, I said that made in the image and likeness of God, God is love. And therefore, we are nothing other than universal love. And all emotions are actually either moving us towards that universal love or moving us away from it. So if any time you have a negative emotion, it doesn't matter if it is self-induced or if it is caused by something outside of yourself, somebody saying something or so, it doesn't matter. But once that negative emotion or feeling comes, it's moving you away from yourself, which is divine love. Any emotion that brings you joy and happiness, especially those that also bring joy and happiness to others around, make you closer to that divine love. Mm. So you can actually test yourself on a daily basis to see how emotionally stable I am, how happy I am 24-7, how angry I am, and then you will know how spiritually evolved you are. You know, it brings me to the point, which I don't know is a question to scientists, but what they do have right now, it's in a practical way, they measure sugar level. Have you heard those yeah. things? Like I did it. You know, they put this, this little circle on, on your arm and you just use an app on your phone and they tell yeah. you you should do this when you wake up, before you have breakfast, after you have breakfast, two hours after you have breakfast, before lunch and so on. So you measure it like up to 10, 15 times a day your sugar level. So as I'm listening to you right now, I am like scientist. It is about time that you <laughs> develop some kind of machine, you know, this the same, like a little circle yes. attached to the body with the app on our phones and people can actually measure their happiness level. So, uh, you yes. know, or like your emotions, you know, it was yeah. said. And it's to me, I'm sort of just uh, a bit surprised that with how evolved our society is and science is at the moment, we still don't have this machine. So my <laughs> little hope is maybe someone is listening to it right now and maybe you were at the university and you study science actually and you're interested <laughs> you know, in this and spirituality and personal development. So please develop a machine like this. We would like to measure <laughs> our emotions in a very clear way, right? But you are the machine. You are the machine. You, you, you are the machine because you are the one who either fool yourself or be truthful to yourself in terms of your own measurement on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Many people who are striving for spiritual growth do what is called spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. That's a very common right. term. Yes. Please yeah. tell, and, tell they, and they do that in order to fake it, in order to make it within their community. Because, you know, people are walking around saying, oh, I'm in bliss, I'm full, I'm this and that. And if you're feeling miserable around people and everybody is appearing to be like, you want to be part of the crowd. So you don't want to say, well, I'm sorry, I'm feeling very miserable and down today, you know. Uh, because then people will say, well, what's wrong with you? Yeah, uh, you don't have enough faith. Your faith is not strong enough. Or you're Maybe, not spiritual uh, enough, or you haven't meditated enough. You're not spiritual enough. enough. Right? Yeah, so let us pray be... for you. Yes. Let us meditate for you. You know, and you you don't want to be the drag on this society. So after a while, you'll say, yeah, I'm blessed. That's me. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually happening in the society. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so we have to be honest with ourselves. Those of us who are really interested in spiritual growth, we have to be honest with ourselves. 
we have to recognize where we are because growth takes time. Mm -hmm. And we have to be patient and we have to be loving to ourselves as we are growing. Because remember, it's a soul's journey. Mm -hmm. And there are many times that this soul would have come into this uh, uh, planet on this planet Earth to go through their stages. Why? Because they have not realized the fullness of themselves. Because of all that they have been taught to believe for thousands of years that everything that you want in life is outside yourself. You want to be happy? You have to go to school, get a good job, have money, and have this and that, or else you will suffer when you get old. And if you buy into that nonsense, you will suffer when you get old. <laughs> and if you believe that love exists in faces and places, then you will always be unhappy searching for love. Mm. So it's a whole paradigm shift that has to take place. First, intellectually, you have to understand that there's a new reality. And then you have to seek that out earnestly. The books, holy books say, keep the company of the wise. Yes. Uh, move around and go around people who are moving on the path that you want. And eventually you will get there. This is what in the old days people did. They went to a master who had that authority and exude that enlightened state. And they bask in that presence and they followed everything that he said. It's called surrender. They surrendered on the level of devotion. Mm -hmm. And what you see, you become. So what, what you keep seeing all the time, practicing all the time, it grows in your life and they become the master. Which brings me then to the next question that you kind of started uh, interview with, you know, and I'm as we are coming soon to the end of our wonderful conversation, which can go forever, but that's probably <laughs> will have to be in another round because there's just so many more things we could really talk about. But then you did mention at the very beginning two words, which I would like you to just elaborate a bit more. When we talk about self-realization and enlightenment, right? So you said that that was the main uh, reason why you decided to write a book about your experience, because many people don't understand what it is. And right. in the conversation we are having today, you're going in all those details and explanations about the journey and what it is, right? And so now my question is, if I were to ask you to explain maybe to us in a few sentences <laughs> or paragraphs, <laughs> what <laughs> is then self-realization and enlightenment in your understanding? Beautiful, beautiful. I have written in my book, we are already enlightened. Mm. <laughs> but we don't have to become enlightened. What we have to do is remove the blocks on our mind, body, and emotions that prevent us from living our enlightened state. It is like you have a mirror, and the mirror has a lot of dust on it. And so you cannot see the reflection clearly in the mirror. And what you have to do is remove the dust until the mirror is clean. Another example could be the sun. The sun is in the sky shining all the time. But on some days, there may be clouds that prevent the sunlight from reaching your part of the earth. It is not that the sun has disappeared. The sun is still there. It's just the clouds that are preventing the sun, the, 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 the sun from shining on your piece of earth. What are those clouds? Those are the stresses and strain on our emotions, on our physical body, on our intellect, all the wrong beliefs and thinking, 
all the programming that we have had from our society, our, our family, our religion, our education, or our culture, all these things prevent us from realizing the truth of who we are. I am divine. I'm made in the image and likeness of God. And so what is self-realization? Very interesting, the word. It is to realize means to become aware of. Aware of what? The self. What self? Myself. And how to become aware of myself is to remove all the distractions that prevent me from seeing who I am. And that's why Mahashi called it transcending. Transcend means to go beyond all the excitations of the mind, of the thought, of the feeling, until the mind goes to this state where it is wide awake within itself, but with no mental or physical activity. In that state of pure consciousness or pure awareness, the breathing is suspended meaning that the instruments cannot measure the inward and outward breath. And that is the goal of pranayama. The goal of pranayama is to still the inward and outward breath. The goal of yoga, yoga is to create union between the atma and the, the, the para atma. That is yoga, union. And so when one transcends, then one is in that state of union. You. This is why uh, Krishna told Arjuna on the battlefield, yoga star kurukamani. Yoga star. Establish yourself in you, in union, and then perform action. Mm. So that's the skill in action. But we have been running out there and we think it's so difficult because the people who did not know the reality said you had to concentrate. You have to still the mind. You have to contemplate. You have to chant all kinds of long things. No, no, no. It is doing less and less and less and less and less and less until you do nothing. It is not by doing more and more because who mind want to be controlled? Do you feel that you want your mind control? No. The mind wants to be free. And so the state of enlightenment is that state of self-realization. But we, we, the difference between self-realization and enlightenment is that in, in self-realization, we become aware of who we are. Enlightenment is the state of self-realization. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, David. That was a truly, truly beautiful conversation and time together and just to be also here with your presence. And I love all the vastness of that wisdom and how it also applies to the reality of the modern world. So thank you for sharing. And I do have a strong feeling it is just the beginning of the conversations we're gonna be having with you in, on various platforms. So thank you very much for being here today. And to all our audiences and people who are listening and watching it right now, of course, we will add all the links. You can connect with David directly and the work that he's doing, if there are questions, or if you wanna know deeper about something. And here at Timeless Teachings, we're going to see you next time. Yeah. Namaste. A gentle reminder that this is not a regular podcast, because here we have no rules and no scripted questions. All conversations are spontaneous, unfiltered, and real with people from all over the world, regardless of their race, religion, nationality, skin color, language, or social circumstances. The intention for this podcast is to showcase the infinite variety of how human beings think and what they do to create happiness, fulfillment, self-realization, health, wealth, legacy, and overall, a truly spectacular life. 
Did you enjoy the interview? Feel free to share this episode with friends, subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel, and follow us on social media. And remember, you are the master of your own life.